Good day and welcome to our discussion uh, on a, a topic of uh, importance. Uh, you will remember that uh, Zimbabwe has been in a subject of international news headlines for a reasonably long period of time. And that has been mostly for wrong reasons, human rights abuses, absence of the rule of law, hyperinflation, rigged elections, and the coup in 2017. Uh, you, it is one country that seems to have more than 50% of its population living outside its own boundaries. And uh, attempts have been made you know, to bring peace, negotiations, uh, but all has just been ineffective. All those efforts have just been uh, what one could call a wild goose chase. So the, the, the title of our discussion tonight is uh, Ntwagazi and Zimbabwe. Are there two countries trapped inside one political boundary, creating a, a state called Zimbabwe, and could that be the cause for the problems in that area, in that place? Now, in recent years, there have been calls for a separation of Matevelele from the present-day Zimbabwe as it is configured. And uh, these calls continue to mount and they seem to be reaching a crescendo. Uh, it seems to be a call that has been, uh, you know, it began as a whisper, but slowly and surely, I think it has attracted the attention of uh, not only the people of Zimbabwe themselves, but even the international community. Now, organizations calling for the separation of uh, two subjoining territories of uh, Shonaland and Matebeleland have actually emerged in recent years and recent decades. Some of these uh, organizations that come to mind, we have the Matebeleland Liberation Organization, headed by Mr. Paul Swela, who at one point faced a, a prison trial until he somehow found his way out of the country. So. Mr. Paul Swela, being the leader of uh, the Matavelelen Libera Liberation Organization, currently resides in exile. And then there have also been other organizations. For instance, we have one with the, led by the likes of uh, Nube, uh, affectionately known as Nandi Nandi at some point. And then also having had people like uh, Churchill Gutuza at the top, and having had uh, such activists as Andreas Banda and uh, the late uh, David Magagula. These are names that really come to the forefront when one talks about the liberation of Mtwagazi from Zimbabwe. But lately, we have uh, Mr. Mkondi Smoyo, uh, who happens to be the leader of a very vibrant and, uh, you know, very determined uh, group calling for an independent homeland, uh, the Mtwagazi Republic Party. <coughs> now, Mtwagazi Republic Party has caused, uh, has steered the, a, a lot of trouble within that country and has also uh, carried out some publicity activities outside the boundary of uh, the country called Zimbabwe. That is the land between the Zambezi and the Limpopo, the land between Ramahwebane and the border with Mozambique. Now, uh, this cause for a separat separatist state are founded on quite a number of reasons that we will eventually revisit, or rather visit, but in the meantime, Let's just highlight that uh, uh, whilst the response of the government has been to silence the voices 
through persecuting, arresting, intimidating the proponents of uh, this idea, as happened in the case of Paul's brother that we referred to earlier on, more and more people have openly endorsed the idea of a free Matevelaland Republic, a Matevelaland homeland, or a Matevelaland state. But one name that seems to have gained traction in recent years is Mtwagazi. Now, uh, while the area is designated as, uh, as Matevelaland, uh, obviously, uh, Mtwagazi uh, gaining popularity through the Mtwagazi Republic Party, led by Mr. Mkondi Smoyo, has actually really uh, made significant inroads in terms of conscientizing the people of Matevele land and, uh, you know, getting them very excited about the idea of an independent Matevele land. Um, without doubt, Mr. Mkondi has emerged as uh, the strongest and most consistent voice in this struggle for the recognition of an independent Tagazi Republic. Now, in light of all that, uh, we need to, to, to mention that uh, since around uh, the 8th of March, uh, some of um, Tagazi's activists have been arrested and incarcerated in the Zimbabwean prison. Some of them are at uh, Kami prison, that is the main, whereas the women have been held at Mlondolozi. Now, uh, one notable thing about uh, these Mtwagazi uh, activists who have been arrested, who were arrested on the 9th of, of, of is it 9th or the 10th of, 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 of March 2021, is that they have not appeared in court. They have not been formally charged. Um, the issue of, uh, you know, the charges laid upon, uh, upon them by the state in terms of uh, the criminal procedure uh, laws, you know, have not really been uh, formalized. So they are being held since that time, uh, at the time of the recording of this message. It's the 28th of April, 2021. And we are saying that since around about the 11th of, of March, these people have been held detained uh, in, a, in holding cells in a prison without being formally charged. And that is very reminiscent of uh, the Rhodesian style of approach to political activism, where people were detained without a charge, a formal charge. And that violates the constitution of Zimbabwe, which uh, states that uh, a person accused of a, or rather charged with an offense must appear before a court within a period of 48 hours where the charges are expected to be pronounced so that uh, the accused can plea, either guilty or whatever plea the, the accused may want to present before the court. But when people are held uh, indefinitely for so long without uh, a formal charge, one then gets to infer that uh, the law is being, you know, uh, subrogated or rather violated whilst uh, personal and political interests are held above everything else. So, and since that time, Mr. Mkondisi has been on the run, living in the bush, in the forest, and uh, this explains the extent to which this Mtwagazi uh, idea has really been uh, received by people and uh, the developments around it. Now, uh, in the midst of all these numerous questions that need to be answered in respect of such an idea, which has been res uh, described by some as uh, extreme, divisive, uh, you know, a recipe for instability and anarchy uh, because some people perceive that it is based on tribalism and uh, so on. The, 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 there's a lot that needs to be discussed, uh, whether it is uh, 
expression of tri tribalism, the Zulu exclusion of a certain section of the population, whether it is driven by hate and so on. These are some of the issues that have come up and maybe they need to be confronted head on. Um, so in this lecture se series, because it's a series, this is just the beginning. In this lecture series, I will attempt to address some of the arguments um, as well as counter arguments that often get to be presented in respect of uh, the issue of uh, a separate homeland or what some people call secession. Or of course, uh, when you talk to the proponents of, of, of this idea, they will tell you that uh, they are not pursuing a secession as such, but uh, it's a restoration of a state that existed until it was of unlawfully overthrown by the British colonialists in 1893-94 the very Anglo war between King Lebanella uh, and uh, the British led by Leander Star Jameson. Now, there are quite four, four issues that I want to deal with in the lecture series. One, I will deal with the basis of the claims of an independent Republic of Mpagadu by these people of Machiavellian. And secondly, I will consider the, uh, the counter arguments often presented in response to this claim and this call. Thirdly, I will deal with the, the issue of the viability of uh, such an idea or such a demand in the light of uh, the benefits that every person in the two subjoining territories of Machiavelli and Mashonaland stand to gain in the event that uh, such an idea materializes. And then fourthly, I will deal with the realities and the lessons that uh, the emergent states of Mpagaza and Zimbabwe will need to learn in order to move more triumphantly into the future as uh, neighbors. Because certainly, if, if this idea comes to fruition, Zimbabwe and Mpagazi would uh, will exist as uh, you know neighbors sharing contiguous land and uh, sharing a common border, which means uh, th there should then be issues of peace and stability around that area. Now, in this current in the current edition of uh, this uh, lecture that I am I'm, I'm taking now, I'm only going to deal with question the, the issues one and two. That is uh, uh, the merits of of the claims, whether there is any claim a, a merit rather to the claims, the basis upon which these claims are established, as well as uh, the counter arguments uh, that have been presented. Was I think most of uh, the discussion around this subject has tended to be more on the emotive side, emotional side. And, you know, we have very interested uh, people discussing these issues. And so the discussions tend to be emotionally charged most of the time. So I, I will endeavor to give a, a very objective assessment. And I hope it turns out to be objective as I have intended to be. Now. Coming back then to the issue of uh, the basis for the, the call. Um, you see, the issue of the basis for separation requires our attention and proponents of a two-state solution argue along the following lines. Uh, the first uh, argument that they raise, that is being raised, is that uh, Zimbabwe has a colonial origin as a concept that uh, whether you talk about Zimbabwe or you talk about Southern Rhodesia, uh, whether you talk about Rhodesia, you are talking about a contraption or a creation uh, of the colonial system because Zimbabwe did not exist as a territory uh, until the advent of colonization in 1894. Now, you will recall that uh, Marshallland was the first to be colonized in 1890. Uh, the pioneer column led by Leander Star Jameson arrived there at uh, what we now call, uh, you know, so Harare, which then was called, so, uh, later on it was called Salisbury. And they mounted a flag whereby they claimed ownership of, 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 the, of the area as the new sovereign. On the 12th of September, in fact, they arrived on the 12th of September, 1890, and then they 
hoisted their Union Jack on the tail end of that one to mark their arrival. And then, and then they began to rule over Mashona land from that part. And they did not rule over Matebele land because a, a, a border or a boundary uh, taking, I mean, along the, the, the Lunyati River was negotiated and signed between Lopengula and the British settlers who were then uh, occupying Mashonaland at that time. So it, it goes without saying then that uh, Mashonaland was colonized first and then it became British territory and it was ruled as British territory while the sovereignty of Matebeleland remained untouched. From 1890 up to November 1893, when war broke out between the Ndebele and the British uh, South Africa Company. So we are saying that uh, the, the, the issue of uh, you know, the creation of Southern Rhodesia, as it was later on called, uh, was done by the, 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 the British colonialists uh, and in phases. So a colonization, Mashonaland was colonized, for example, I've already mentioned that. And then uh, the two subjoining territories were then joined by col colonialists uh, without consultation with the people. So in other words, when they arrived, they found two societies, two groups of people living independently, but side by side with one another. And then when they decided to create a colony, which they later on called Southern Rhodesia, they just you know, bungled these two nations together, if one could put it that way, without really consulting the people. And even at independence in 1979, 1980, they just handed them out as one unit. But because of the distinctiveness of these uh, uh, you know, territories and uh, communities, this has caused problems, insurmountable problems, uh, whereby one can say for the past 41 years that Zimbabwe is said to have been independent, there has not really been peace. Uh, there has not really been any, any peace uh, you know, in the palace. There has ne there's never been. So still on that uh, issue of colonization and the creation of a state, uh, it is regrettable that uh, the post-colonial uh, entity called Zimbabwe is actually a continuation of colonization by other means in that it, it independence did not undo the effects of colonization in spite of the fact that uh, the war of the 1960s and the 1970s had actually been waged and prosecuted with the intention to undo the effects and uh, the results of colonization. So the argument goes that, uh, you know, the illegality of, uh, colonial, of colonization, which was outlawed by international law, really in a way viewed as a crime in international law and then reversed uh, uh, in the 19, you know, f in the aftermath of uh, the Second World War. It, you know, its results still remain today um, this so-called uh, sovereignty and intake colonial, uh, what we call territorial integrity of uh, Zimbabwe is actually an indirect way of honoring uh, colonization. In other words, it's an ex post facto uh, legitimization of, of an illegal transaction that was uh, unilaterally done by, by the British, whereby without the consent of the people and without any consultation or discussion, they went on to create a, an entity that is now called Zimbabwe. So in other words, Zimbabwe is a product of an, in, of a colonial, an illegal colonial in, uh, transaction, and therefore upholding its product is an illegal continuation of you know, a scenario which uh, ought to have been you know, disbanded altogether. Uh, so, uh, looking at uh, the United, uh, United Nations Resolution 1514, whereby the, uh, which dealt with the declaration of uh, on the granting of independence to countries and peoples under foreign rule, 
uh, seen much, much as a violation of human rights. Uh, Zimbabwe should really have then been reviewed uh, so that uh, a redrawing of, of the boundaries could uh, go a long way in terms of restoring the dignity of the people that was lost through colonization. And thirdly, there is an argument that colonialists themselves anticipated a, a two-state solution when it came to Zimbabwe. Because it seems like they always ran those two territories as uh, independent of each other until fairly lately, uh, maybe uh, at the in inauguration of the Federation of Rhodesia. Otherwise, how do you explain the fact that uh, there are two state houses? Was one is in, 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 in Harare, formerly Salisbury, and then the other one is in Bulawayo. Those who are familiar with the Bulawayo will know the area around North Lee High School. There is a state house there, which then indicates that uh, the British settlers anticipated that on granting independence, they would, you know, separate these two territories and each one would get its own uh, self-governing authority of some kind. So we have two state houses, we have two reserve banks uh, existing side by side, one in Bulawayo, another one in Salisbury, and then we also happen to have two high courts. Again, a, 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 an acknowledgement of the fact that, uh, you know, this, this is not one uh, political entity or legal entity for that matter. And then uh, you will recall that uh, during that time, the appellate division uh, for all issues, uh, that is legal issues, used to be the Privy Council in the United Kingdom. So there was not a need to refer any matters, say, from the Bulawayo High Court to, to the Salisbury High Court. It was not structured that way. And then there's also the issue of two capitals, whereby Salisbury conserved as a, the administrative capital of uh, the then Rhodesia, while Bulawayo served as uh, the industrial capital. Uh, that was an acknowledgement of, uh, you know, the generous faced nature of that state, whereby it was clear that there are two states. Each state was expected to run its own affairs to the extent that it could. And then the other uh, interesting observation by proponents of uh, separatism is that the armed struggle of 1962 to 1979 was actually a fight a fight for self-determination, and uh, this struggle was wedged to overthrow colonization and to end decolonization. And therefore, Matabeleland has not achieved independence since its overthrow as a state by the British in 1894. And that is clearly recorded in history that this was a, a viable state, a sovereign state, until uh, 19, uh, sorry, until 1894. So, if this had been a, a struggle to overthrow colonization, and meanwhile, Matavelaland has not received uh, any 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 uh, any independence, it has not been decolonized. Therefore. Uh, the, uh, rather, colonization for Matavela has consist has continued since 1894 up to the present day. That goes the argument. And then, interestingly, still talking about uh, the armed struggle, is the observation that there were two armed struggles fought side by side. So for somebody to conflate the Zipra struggle with the Zandla struggle, and give the whole world an impression that there was one struggle is actually to mislead everybody. It's a distortion of, of, of the truth. Those were two armed struggles waged by two separate organizations. Uh, some people may argue that uh, the executives of Zapu and Zanu uh, did not uh, maybe anticipate a two statehood uh, you know, struggle. Uh, but the truth is on the ground, the practical issue is that there was a zipra um, controversy with struggle prosecuted from Zambia 
liberating the greater part of, of, of in fact, the, the whole of Matebeleland and the, the, the northwestern parts of, of Zimbabwe, that is of Mashona land, such as Wurungwe and so on. But otherwise, the idea, the very clear uh, issues on the ground were that uh, there were two struggles. Because remember, the, 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 the Zapu and Zanu, with their Zipra and Zandla forces, had tried to unite during the struggle, but everything turned out to be, you know, it was a complete flop, a complete fiasco. Is those who know the history of that struggle will remember the Morogoro and the Mgagao uh, falling away between Zipra and the Zandla forces and how they went on to fight and, you know, kill one another. So it is an indication that these people never perceived themselves as one. They always perceive themselves as two independent and two separate groups pursuing uh, goals. Maybe at that time they had a common uh, enemy that was uh, the, the, the Rhodesians, but it did not mean that they perceived themselves as one such that uh, after independence or after overthrowing the British, they then had to, set to exist as one state. There is no evidence to that effect. Anybody who tries to proffer that kind of an argument is uh, you know, shoehorning the argument and stretching it a little further uh, to achieve mischievous uh, outcomes and goals. Now, so we have spoken about two separate uh, armed struggles, and we are saying it was neither a coincidence or accident, coincident or accident that the two parties involved in the struggle to overthrow the Rhodesian state launched two parallel wars, one from Zambia and the other from Tanzania, Mozambique, the societies have always viewed themselves as different, distinct, and having unique needs. Zipra and Umkondo Oasis were liberated from Pagas right up to the Midlands as well as Urungwe and other northern parts, while Zandla liberated Manshona land area and Manika land. So some people have argued that uh, of a Zapu leadership did not anticipate separation. Therefore, Mtogas was never their ideal, but those were the exigencies of the times. But the facts on the ground reflect two states fighting side by side to dislodge a common enemy. Of course, of, as we have said, not a coincidence that uh, even these armies drew their recruits from the areas where, you know, they, they tended to, 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 to have much influence. Uh, of course, it is true that Zap was not only, did not consist only of Bindebele, but of course, it also had some Shona elements, just as much as the, the, the Zanu also had, uh, Zim, Zanda also had some Ndebele elements. But the predominant recruiting uh, was done uh, in, uh, according to, to those di divisions. Now, uh, and another interesting observation still on the issue of uh, the basis is uh, that the post-1980 relations on the ground between the communities of Matebeleland and the communities of Mashonaland reflect that these are two distinct societies, two distinct uh, political communities which have just been brought together by an accident of history and by British colonial mischief. Now, the collapse of uh, the Lancaster uh, House Accord speaks testimony to this. You will remember that when Zapu and Zanu went to Lancaster House to discuss, they discussed as uh, what was then called the pa Patriotic Front. But as soon as uh, you know the, 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 the agreement was signed, and uh, before the ink even dried on the papers, uh, that there was a, a split. Uh, while uh, Zapu had expected that the election would be contested on a patriotic front ticket, Zan had, had a different idea altogether. So that's why we end up in the in 1980 specifically at the election, we end up with uh, Zapu participating by itself as the PF Zapu, while Zanu also participates separately uh, as Zanu PF. They just uh, retained the patriotic front PF element, but otherwise, they were no longer one. So there was a collapse of the Lancaster Accord. Because you see, there was illegality now uh, as, as surrounding 
the, the well, I would say the, 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 the 1980 uh, election and, and participation in that the patriotic front had already ruptured, which means the, the, the basis of the election itself had fallen away. So in a way, the, the, those elections had lost that, that legality. They were no longer legal because now they were being contested by the, you know, parties that had not really signed or been part of a, an agreement. But anyway, that's a, a discussion for another day. And so we are saying the fact that uh, we have two states living side by side is demonstrated also by the hostilities that broke out. Um, you remember at Entumbane, 1980, November as well as 1981. Um, it was a sign and a clear indication that Zipra and Zanla did not per perceive themselves as the forces that could belong to the same army. And it was not even a coincidence that the Zipra spoke predominantly spoke Ndebele as a language. No, the language is in Matabele, and that is uh, the Kalanga, the Tonga, the Benda, the Nambia, the, the Futu, Tosa, Ndembe, uh, while uh, Zanla was predominantly Shona speaking. So that also spoke of two separate uh, communities living side by side. Now, I think if there had been any attempts really to create a state, I, I would borrow the words of uh, Professor Sabelo uh, who says that uh, uh, in a way implies that uh, if really Zimbabwe was born in 1980, then it probably was born with a very bad birth mark. And I would hasten to say it had some congenital defects that have made it very, very difficult to grow into a mature uh, state. It has had a standard growth, very distinct, right from the, 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 the first day. Talk about the Guguraundi atrocities. Um, whereby a very atrocious, you know, killing and extermination of non-Shona speaking people between 1982 and 1987, so 1988, one could say. A lot of people have dealt with this issue that uh, it will just receive a footnote in my own discussion here. But it suffices to state without equivocation that this incident in history, in the history of these subjoining territories, is the thorn in the flesh, the Achilles wheel, heel rather, in the so-called Zimbabwe nation building project. Because it accounts from the death of more than 20,000 people uh, with abductions, with the disappearances, you know. Uh, th there's a lot that really took place. And uh, ma mention of Kukura only invokes painful mem memories for the people of Matabeleme. The pain and the misery are aggravated by the fact that, you see, uh, the state is not willing to apologize. And uh, there is so much indifference displayed by Zimbabwean people towards the effects of, of, of these unfortunate events. So this refusal by the government to apologize speaks to the disdain that it speaks of the disdain with which the Ndeveles or the Matevele people are treated by Zimbabwe and Zimbabweans in general. And the Matevelelas have never been recognized as Zimbabweans except in incidences of political, uh, political patronage as well as uh, <coughs> some wind of blessing. Besides that, they have not really been given that uh, honor and that uh, place as a people of Zimbabwe. <coughs> Now, there are implications, um, rather, there are implicit acknowledgments of, of separation of destiny. Uh, in 1980, Zimbabwe reacted to Matavela land as it would re react to a foreign land to be subdued, to be conquered, to be controlled, and to be treated as occupied territory. No effort was at undertaken to build one nation on the basis of consensus or a common vision and uh, common aspirations or a common destiny. It is no wonder that the national question remains unresolved 
uh, as uh, Professor Jonathan Moyo would put it, it's one of those outstanding mm. uh, issues whenever you talk about, uh, you know, Zimbabwe's problem. So, you see, Kukura Undi was an invasion and a war of conquest, whereby Zimbabwe sought to establish its control over Matevile land. Now, one question you would ask yourself is, if Matevile land was always a part of Zimbabwe, why would it have been necessary to conquer the territory between 1982 and 1987? Why this heavy-handedness? Why the, you know, the most heavy-handed uh, approach to civilians and armed butchering of women butchering of children butchering of men not at war but at a time of peace to the point of killing 20,000 of them so these are issues that will you know seem to bolster the argument by um, among the Matevele people that they, they are a separate state and they would rather pursue their own destiny as, as distinct and a separate people from the rest of Zimbabwe. Now, some people would say the Unity Accord must have uh, served to, you know, polish or rather mend the relations between, uh, you know, Mashona land and Matevele land. But uh, many people fail to realize that this Unity Accord was an amnesty. It was a ceasefire agreement. Um, you see, if you are obsessed with the rosy face of Zimbabwe National Project, then you conveniently refuse to see through the smoke screen of the Unity Accord. Because, you know, it happened at a time when Matevele Land was under military of, uh, occupation. It happened at a time when men and women were being butchered with reckless abandon, without the intervention of anyone, not even the international community. So in order to save the people, uh, Joshua Nkomo and Zafu had no choice but to surrender. So the Unity Accord must really be understood, understood within its context as a surrender document by a people hemmed in on the left and on the right by a heavily armed force while they themselves were not, uh, uh, you know, armed. So, uh, it, just like uh, the Lancaster House Accord, the Unity Accord was just a, a negotiated ceasefire between the armed state and the unarmed Matevele civilians. So, you know, that the fact that Nkomo surrendered to Zani and he insisted to get at that conference has come to be celebrated year after year, much to the misery of those who surrender. Now, you see, there is a very interesting statement made by Mandela at some point when he said, prisoners cannot negotiate deals. They cannot sign contracts. It is only free men who can do so. So in other words, for anybody to be talking about the unity accord, ignoring the fact that it was obtained without consensus, without a meeting of minds, uh, because it was forced upon the throat of Joshua Nkomo and his political structure. They had no option. The whole world had abandoned them. They could not have gone ahead and resisted ZANU PF military power. So in order to save the people, the few people that remained after the slaughter of the more than 20,000, they had to, you know, surrender themselves and surrender their freedoms and surrender their humanity. And just come to think of it, the holiday that is held year after year on the 23rd of, Se of December to celebrate the Unity Accord is actually a constant reminder of uh, uh, the loved ones who were butchered mercilessly by Zanu PF. So year after year, Zimbabwe purports to hold a, a unity day, but in actual fact, the impact is it is a constant reminder to those who lost their brothers, who lost their fathers, who lost their sisters, who lost their mothers, who lost their grandparents, some of whom are still maimed even unto today. People who witnessed 
in Thanos whereby families were whole families were thrown into grass huts and burnt in there. So this is what the unity accord is and what the unity day means. It's a celebration of the misery of those that were tortured under his rule. Now, uh, with that in mind, we are saying, instead of achieving the goal of the so-called nation building, the unity uh, uh, agreement and the unity day has been this current recurrent celebration and posturing by the victorious, a match of victory that the vanquished have possibly thrown uh, upon their victims who have been forced to celebrate in continual humiliation year after year. And somebody has been claiming that they are building a nation, but if anything, that has been tearing that project down in the past. Now, so that then brings us to the issue of the unresolved nation que national question. Uh, we are talking here about the question of who, of who a Zimbabwean is. Uh, it's a concept that has not been defined. The practice on the ground has been that to be a Zimbabwean is to be Shona, is to speak Shona, and it is to endorse everything Shona. Just as much as uh, the Gugura Hundis would make people sing Shona songs in Pungwe Zovanai, you know, indoctrinated them, indoctrinating them in Shona ideology and teaching them that in order to survive, you must speak Shona. It is actually undeniable that, uh, you know, the call for an Mutuagasu state is actually a way of resisting the Shona hegemony, the Shona triumphalism, and all that the language and the culture represents. So, as a result, the young Shona people in Zimbabwe have openly and are uh, passively, they are, they are, they are openly uh, rejected by the nation, the so-called nation. And if you have to call yourself a Zimbabwean while you are non-Shona, you are then having to deny your own identity, deny yourself of human dignity in order to endorse Zimbabweanhood, which is only expressed in Shona culture, in Shona song, in Shona po praise poetry, in you know, everything, drama, everything, Shona acts. Now, so you can only be a Zimbabwean at your own cost, at the cost of human dignity, at the cost of pride, at the cost of the self, at your traditional homestead, at Nkosika's communal lands, or in Lopani, or in Binga, or in Plantu, or in Teti, or in Gwanda, or in Baitbridge. You have to relinquish your Isindebele, your Tonga, your Nambia, your Kalanga, your Shuku, your Genda, your Kosa, whatever you speak. You, you know, you have got to relinquish that language in order to really don a Zimbabwean gap, which incidentally is speaking Shona at every roadblock in Machiavelli across the country. If you can't speak Shona, you can't drive from any part of the, of the country to your own homestead. So, uh, you know, there is an imposition of Shona culture on everybody. And that on its own I is actually gener generating this revulsion and this search for an independent homeland where people would like to be free. Now, sadly, those who benefit from uh, the Shona triumphalist system remain in denial of the injustice they trivialize the cries of the marginalized, whom they constantly accuse of laziness, and they label them as being uneducated, and uh, you know, they lack innovation. You can imagine all kinds of denigrating uh, discourse that has been employed, just in order to push a narrative that uh, they deserve what they are, if they are in the lowest echelons of society, it's because they deserve it. So there is so much insensitivity to the needs and the cries of these people. Now, uh, another very important observation to make is that uh, Kukura Wundi was not an, inc an, an incident. It, was, it does not really uh, 
only uh, constitute the events between 1982 and 1987 or 88 where people were openly killed and so on. It is a system and there is a continuation of that system or genocide by other means. You see, the 1987 surrender agreement culminated in the destruction of ZAPO, ended monitor and only ended open military occupation, but uh, it also saw an, inc I mean, a development of a, a, a system of exclusion, systematic exclusion, displacement, frustration of people of much available. And uh, this has gone unchecked. The land that uh, they used to occupy in Matavalere is being given to people that speak Shona. And it is an open secret. So there is an open colonization taking place now in the aftermath of, of the so-called War of Liberation. Now, one only needs to visit uh, places like Hilbro, Eria, and Yuvel in Johannesburg, South Africa in order to appreciate the extent of this ongoing genocide. Millions and millions of men and women and children are living on the fringes of society, having been displaced from their homes and from their country. You see, these people have neither identity documents, nor jobs, nor livelihood. They are living, like I've said, on the fringes of society. They give, they give birth to children who in turn do not obtain birth certificates, so they can't get IDs and they can't go to school. Now, they are doomed to continue on the fringes of society too. And we have a whole Mkwagazi, a whole Mkwagazi population which remains stateless, nationless, except that they belong to a virtual state, which is the Mkwagazi state, which they have just coined, and uh, it is their only hope. Now, there is this uh, op 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 open and outright denial of rights and citizenship. Uh, it's achieved through systematic and systemic exclusion, and uh, this is what fits into the fences of an independent whole nation. So sometimes you find you can't blame these people because you talk about these millions that do not have a place to call home. They don't have a state. They don't have a passport. They don't have an ID. They are not even entitled to any. And these people are living day by day. Now, what do you expect them to think? Now, you see, <coughs> um, these are some of the issues uh, uh, that, that we really we need to, 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 to think about from time to time. And so thinking about the international criteria for statehood as uh, you know, expounded uh, in the Montevideo Convention of 1933, whereby we are saying there must be distinct territory, distinct population, an effective government, and ability to enter into diplomatic relations. Uh, the people then are beginning to fence the idea of an independent homeland, uh, seeing that material land is distinct territory. That's why the names themselves make it very clear that it's Mashona land and material land. The British are the ones who maintained those names. Material land is for material people. Mashona land is for Mashona people. That part is very clear. I don't know why somebody would want to argue any, any, any contrary or in any other way away from that. Tevinland is distinct territory with a unique and distinct population. Now, though the people speak different languages, they perceive themselves as one people. And this oneness has also been fostered by the fact that they have lived harmoniously, that they lived harmoniously before uh, the, the, the advent of colonialism, and then they have suffered the same fate and the same destinies at the hand of uh, a Shona-dominated and a Shona-led government. It's not tribalism. It is a fact that the people that came to Matavalele perpetrating uh, atrocities spoke lo a language called Shona, 
They told everybody to speak Shona. They forced everybody to speak Shona. They even told people to go back to KZN. They said KZN go back to South Africa. And even after, uh, in recent years, we have had ministers of government, like Kenneth Mitoy, saying that uh, the, the people that stay in Mantemelele are actually South, Afri South Africans, which thing is a lie, because a majority of the people there are indigenous. Right, but anyway, that's an argument and a story for another day. So uh, the issue of uh, whether Matabeleland has a, a government um, and uh, is able to enter into diplomatic relations, these are issues that can only be uh, verified at a later stage. So, but the preliminary issues are that uh, there is a very strong and a compelling argument that Matabeleland really is a state separate and distinct from Zimbabwe. Now, so this, the, the, the two state or two nation solution shows that uh, there are two nations trapped in one political border, living in mutual suspicion. The preoccupation of Zimbabwe since 1980, 1980 has been to silence, exclude, overcome, conquer um, the uh, territory of Matabeleland. As a result, there has never been time for governance. Everyone remains trapped in this one border with unresolved conflict, unresolved genocide and the Burundi issues. And these two distinct nations can just separate so that each one of them pursues its own agendas free of the fear of the other, or of the consequences uh, of these unresolved issues. So clearly, there are two nations here, and it's not one. Uh, well, maybe somebody would say, what is a nation? A nation simply uh, defined is a, a group of people living together in one territory, uh, sharing a common history, a common culture, common values, common aspirations, and a common destiny. So such people perceive themselves as one people. But one question what that one may ask is whether the people in the current uh, state called Zimbabwe, as it is configured, whether they really perceive themselves as one nation. I would hazard to say that uh, there has just been a lot of uh, glossing and window dressing and, you know, trying to conveniently look away from the realities. I think these people, let's be honest, have not endorsed one another as members of one country or as members of one nation. They are nations existing side by side. Maybe a marriage of convenience of the 1960s and the struggle. Maybe it is high time it was uh, dissolved because after 41 years, it is very clear that the message, or rather that the marriage, has fallen apart, if at all it was ever consummated. Now, so the issue of a common destiny is certainly absent here. Uh, at the moment, one nation has conquered another. And the fear of revolt by the conquered uh, uh, nation keeps dogging uh, the, 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 the conquering nation such that development in respect of both nations uh, remains elusive because you can't really uh, sit down to develop things when you always have to, you know, mind the oppressed in the case we all to stand up. So that is the issue. Now, so those are the arguments uh, in favor of uh, what one would call uh, a, a, a separatist agenda, whereby people are saying Matabeleland is a state distinct from Zimbabwe and therefore must be granted its independence with immediate effect. But there are counter arguments that have been presented uh, uh, just, you know, to balance things up, to say uh -uh, things are not as the way you seem to see. So some of the counter arguments uh, which have been raised to dispel the push for separate existence include that uh, the one which says 
Zimbabwe is a unitary state founded on the principles of the liberation struggle. So uh, the liberation struggle is perceived to have given birth to one state. But as, as, a, as a way of maybe analogy, uh, let's imagine that a thief walks into the neighborhood and steals from three or four houses. And then people become aware of the whereabouts of the thief and then uh, they run after the thief and eventually they catch up with the thief and they retrieve, restore, or rather he drops the, the, the stolen property and runs away. Do we then uh, come back and say, because the thief had stolen from every one of those houses, therefore the property now belongs to everybody collectively. Or would we not be able to still give the individual items stolen back to their owners? Well, that's my take, that's my take. But anyway, <coughs> so this argument seems to suggest that uh, a, a liberation struggle would by fluke or chance create a state, even though those people may not have had anything in common, just because they're fighting a common enemy. Therefore, when that enemy is gone, they must now stay together. I don't know if that is very logical, but to me that sounds very absurd, very absurd argument, very lousy argument. Um, for instance, uh, if one were to take this same argument a little further, one would ask why col collaboration between Zipra and Umkonto Osivu, who were assisted by Zambia, did not then create one state. Because Zipra and Umkonto Osivu fought side by side. In fact, they fought with one army, but they still did not create one state. So what then gives uh, Zimbabwe the right to create a state out of a liberation struggle? Uh, that really doesn't make much sense. So an alliance could not have created a state. Um, and in any case, th th there were two wars. There were two separate wars that were fought to, over to, to overcome the British. There was a Zipra war, there was a Zanda war. And the British only happened to be in the midst of it. But those were two wars. So separate wars liberated the territory and therefore they could not have in their separate uh, uh, identities and created one thing. And the other argument, or rather counter argument, is that the territory has been administered as one since the colonial times. Therefore, you know, people tend to uphold this sanctity of political um, boundaries created by uh, the colonial system. And that's hypocrisy. That's hypocrisy at its worst. You never have never had any hypocrisy that goes beyond that. Because if colonialism was an illegal act, it's an illegal British act, unilaterally undertaken by the British, without consent of the, the, the communities involved, how could then colonialism confer statehood to territories that it had stolen by force? So that's very absurd and very, very illogical. Colonialism was a unilateral British action which could not have created a state from people that did not have a common past or a common destiny. Now, another uh, argument or counter argument has been that uh, the Zimbabwean community is now so fully integrated that seeking to separate the territories would be counterproductive. Maybe let's look at the merit of that one. Say, we are saying such a view refuses to recognize that the so-called unity has been achieved at the expense of the people of Makerere, whose resources have been looted, plundered, used to develop people elsewhere outside Makerere. So it, it is like saying, let us stay in this union so that one section of the population can continue to benefit at the expense of the others. And then, some people have argued that the cost of separation politically, economically, and ETC would be retrogressive. Some people are saying it, 
man, is everything a war and there's so on and so forth? But one would ask how many people from Matelelele and from Zimbabwe have died there by Limpopo River, been eaten by crocodiles while they were running away from uh, ZANU PF government. How many Matelele people have died uh, in foreign lands owing to xenophobia in South Africa and all other attacks because they happen to be uh, illegally occupying areas where they ought not to be? Is that not war in itself? So which other war would be worse than that? What about the issue of starvation, the issue of disease, communities that don't have medical care, communities that are starved to be a death because genocide is being systematically unleashed on them day by day. There is no worse of war than what ZANU-PF has already put before us, before the people. So this argument also lacks credibility to some extent, in fact, to a great extent. And then some people are advocates of what they call devolution, some crazy monster that seems to split in front of them. They can't even catch a hold of it. It is just some imaginary thing. They're saying the devolution of power can achieve equitable distribution of resources as a better option to uh, fully flesh the statehood. Now, this is very, very, uh, this raises some curious questions to say, you see, there is absence of political will to implement devolution. In fact, Matevelelen has been occupied by Spanish-speaking people. You see, there have been more people coming in after the adoption of uh, the 2013 constitution than they ever did before. So we are talking about, uh, you know, the rhetoric on devolution just being used, you know, to buy time while we are expecting or waiting for the impl implementation of devolution. Uh, they are quickly, they are slowly moving in, taking over territory and displacing a whole population. Tonga, Kivenda, Inambi, Indebele, Ikosa, Ikalanga, Itswana, Lesotho, and Ibenda, and every other, you know, people, person in Mashonaland, uh, sorry, in Matevelele, in the Midlands. So these are the kind of things that we continue to experience. Now, don't forget that, uh, as some people say, zanu pf govern misgovernance is the problem and not uh, unitarism. They are saying that uh, Matevele people are looking at uh, the wrong thing. In other words, we, they should not be looking at, uh, they should not be talking in terms of uh, separating because zanu pf is abusing everybody. That goes the argument. But they forget the fact that there was a time when zanu pf was not abusing everybody. And during that time, they were enjoying the, the, the rosy time. And they call those the sunshine years. So this argument overlooks the, the, the fact that material and uh, abuse predates Zimbabwe, or, uh, I mean, Zanu's abuse or misgovernment. So as a result, to suggest that uh, the people of material and should hold hands with the other parties, uh, so-called national parties such as the NPC and so on, dislodge them, and then later on people can talk about, uh, you know, these issues. It's a lie from the pit of hell because the same party seem to have the same ideas about Matevelele. And besides, the people of Matevelele have learned from the past. They worked side by side with the Shona to dislodge the British. No sooner had the British been dislodged than did they turn against and, slaw and slaughter and butcher people in cold blood. So now, should the people of Matevelele participate with the MDC in a project to dislodge ZANU, is there an assurance that when ZANU-PF is dislodged, uh, 
these MDC guys will not turn around and do exactly that which Zanupiev did, uh, you know, against uh, Zappo and so on. Now, there are those who say that secession has little precedent in post-colonial uh, Africa. Uh, they are saying it is impracticable. And then they go on to cite quite a number of uh, societies and communities that have tried to achieve uh, secession. For instance, we talk about Kasmans in, in, in Senegal or the Toko Ghana. Uh, you know, the, there is a group of people there that is calling for secession. And then we talk about the Saharawi in, in Northwest Africa. And then they, some people talk about the, the struggles that have been going on in Ambazonia, in, in Cameroon, and the Barbrosalan project. And they are saying because of that, it is a sign that Mutuagazi is not going to succeed. So they are saying, as a result, why don't we try to negotiate within the context of Zimbabwe so that uh, we don't, uh, you know, uh, plunge the whole area into chaos and conflict because they are saying secession is most likely to lead to conflict. But uh, another question one might want to ask is whether by so doing, uh, the, 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 the Batwagazi people will not be postponing the, 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 the struggle in a way. Remember, Bob Marley says he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So why wait now? for something that will not resolve itself. Because I think for 41 years, the Batwagazi people seem to have ab adopted what one would call an ostrich approach uh, to, to, to the problem of burying the, the head in the sand and assuming that things will solve themselves. And the meanwhile, uh, th this uh, triumphalism uh, of a Shona uh, dominated government has continued to spread its tentacles and, you know, its roots into material territory. So to, to delay uh, the issue and assume that it will solve itself is actually to give them room to totally exterminate the people and the children. So we have people who are concerned that they are stateless, or their children are stateless, and they are leaving the children their children with a legacy of statelessness. Uh, so, whether uh, this will succeed or not, I think it depends on, on each, each, each case. Um, how is it that uh, Southern Sudan managed, after some time, of course, we know that uh, it, the struggle cost John Garang his life, but eventually the vision was realized. Southern Sudan is now an, an independent state, independent and free, separate from the Northern Sudan. So there, there is also the issue that, uh, you know, the issue around uh, this United Nations uh, idea on the sanctity of uh, boundaries based on the principle of uti positatis, which says as you possess, you hold that which you possess. So in terms of that principle, um, the boundaries, colonial boundaries, uh, handed down at independence of the African states should not be revised. So they are saying each of those political entities should hold on to that which was handed to it by the colonial system. Well. This uh, kind of thinking actually resonated well with people like Kwame Nkrumah and people like uh, Tamora Machel and people like Julius Nyerere who thought that it was a, a great idea that uh, these ideas, I mean, these boundaries should never be revised. So because of that principle which outlaws the use of force to redraw boundaries, you find very odd states in Africa where, because of the arbitrary uh, production and drawing of, of boundaries, communities were mutilated and dissected and kept, you know, apart. And uh, while some strange bedfellows were brought together, uh, 
in an uh, in arrangements that engender conflict rather than stability. So uh, you see, you, you, you look at it and think uh, this outlaw lowing of the use of force is nothing other than legitimizing colonialism ex post facto. facto. That is, uh, you know, giving it, uh, sanitizing it and giving it that image that uh, even though colonialism was there, its products are good. I think that's hypocrisy, as I have already alluded to. So these arbitrarily uh, drawn boundaries, that is African boundaries of state, are the cause for most of the conflicts in Africa. And uh, the sooner they are resolved, the better. Because protecting these boundaries is nothing other than an attempt to maintain peace by suppression. So if we are going to maintain peace by suppression and assume that it is justified and assume that uh, extermination of whole populations, uh, removal of whole populations, displacement of whole populations of people from territory is something fine, then surely it is very clear that somebody somewhere is being blatantly dishonest. So, uh, looking at this, these uh, uh, foregoing facts or rather uh, uh, arguments that have been considered here, it is clear that Zimbabwe is not one nation, but it is two nations trapped inside one body. And keeping these states together as one, on the basis and the hope that uh, the long-term containment within one political boundary will uh, resolve itself and bring some magical solution is actually to delay and frustrate everybody's freedom. Uh, very clearly, even though some people argue that uh, the resultant states will be too small, See, that argument doesn't really hold water because there are states that are smaller, small, far, far smaller than either the, the residual Zimbabwe that uh, Zimbabweans will have after uh, Matabele and, and Chagas have their independence. Yes, there are countries far, far smaller than that. And uh, the same applies to, to Matabele and territory. That territory is very, very big. So, uh, the idea to say that uh, the resultant countries will be too small is just uh, a way to, to try. It's a lousy argument to try and keep them together. But the point is, these two will make and form viable states which would exist side by side as a, you know, friendly neighboring states depending on how the whole process is undertaken. So the next uh, lecture will look at uh, the other uh, points that we have not covered today. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to meeting you next time on the next upload. Thank you. Bye-bye.